I never felt comfortable with maids. It always felt wrong to me, but we were given them. Isn't that an awful thing to share? But it was part of the payment. My mum, over the 50 plus years since, has repeated many times a story about how she caught Dorothy, the ironing maid, stealing food. And every time, it's like a dagger in my heart. Never once did we ever talk with Dorothy about her family that I remember, and it would be uncharacteristic for my mum to do that. It always felt to me like slavery, even though she was free to leave any time. You're listening to Your Money, Your Business, the podcast with me, Debbie Colburn. I'm a small business expert and a former professional accountant turned money mindset guide. And I am obsessed with helping you achieve all those things you've dreamed of and thought were out of your reach with helping you figure this money stuff out. My goal on this podcast is to help you break the cycle of feast or famine with your cash flow and to help you grow your wealth and sustain it over the long term. We dive deep, we get real and we get raw, discovering and exploring what is really possible for you and letting go of all those things that are holding you back. If you've ever thought it's not enough looking at your bank balance or think I'll never get that paid off when you open up the credit card statement, maybe you're sick and tired of constantly being worried of just getting by and you know you're missing out on key opportunities again and again, or maybe you're done with the constant arguments over money, then this is absolutely the right place. We'll bring you a whole new way to look at money, profit, cash, wealth, tackle the challenges, share the ideas, the tips and the tactics and the strategies, and get you connected to the right resources. Think of this as your weekly prescription of money mastery development and leave the hard work up to me. No matter what's going on in your life right now, I've got your back. Ready? Buckle up. Take a deep breath and join me in a conversation about breakthrough to the next level. Welcome to episode 112. And today I thought it would be interesting to chat a bit with everyone about some of the things that affect how we feel about our money. So this episode dabbles a bit in the world of diversity, culture, family, and environment that you grow up in. Now, What I do want to say at the outset is that I can only speak from my personal experiences, which, while very diverse and eclectic and kind of all over the world, literally, I am a white 67-year-old woman, and I recognize that while things were not handed to me on a silver platter, yes, even that single reference can trigger people, that I do have blind spots. And I'm always open to being more mindful and kind, empathetic, helpful, open to feedback, sharing with other perspectives. And I hope those in my audience are as well. So to give a little context to this this discussion, in my preteens, my brother and I, along with my mom and my dad, moved to Guyana in South America, a former British colony, British Guyana, only recently independent when we moved there. The simple fact that my dad is, well, cheap, meant that while we lived in a townhouse provided to us by what is now called Global Affairs Canada, a department of the Canadian government that manages diplomatic and consular relations, promotes Canadian international trade, and leads Canada's international and humanitarian assistance, we as a family experience South America, the people and the places, in a very unique fashion more similar to locals than a typical expat. My dad was there as a teacher, a professor at the Technology Institute, doing exactly what he did in Canada, just getting paid four, at least four times as much with almost no cost to live. That single posting to Guyana set the stage for my dad's, well, 
our family's saving and investment strategy, a jumpstart that he could likely not have made in Canada. A move he made several times on his own and with us at home for several shorter periods of three to six months to places like Port-au-Prince in Haiti, San Paulo in Brazil, Montpellier in France. The Canada savings bonds that paid for my university tuition or bailed my brother out and the 27-foot Contessa sailboat he bought for, used, used, used from a friend can all be tied directly back to those two and a half years, I believe. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Guyana, it features, most people didn't know where it is. Now they do. It features in the Discovery Channel's gold rush in later seasons. Well, due to its gold resources. Beside us lived the judge, a really well-respected judge, a Bajan family from Barbados of African descent, black. And while we drove in our Morris Minor wagon that my dad had shipped there, they got driven around in their sh by their chauffeur in the Mercedes. It is this simple fact that on reflection a couple of years ago when the George Floyd and Black Lives Matter protests were happening and everyone was writing or diving into books on diversity and inclusion, that I realized that I felt very differently because I had felt less than, unworthy, poorer than the black family. Yes, we had a gardener, a man who came by with his machete and a donkey. We had three maids, one to clean the house, one to do the washing and the ironing, and one, well, I think she kind of looked after my baby sister who was born there. I never felt comfortable with maids. It always felt wrong to me, but we were given them. Isn't that an awful thing to share? But it was part of the payment. My mom over the 50 plus years since has repeated many times a story about how she caught Dorothy, the ironing maid, stealing food. And every time it's like a dagger in my heart. Never once do I ever recall them talking with Dorothy about her family that I remember. And it would be uncharacteristic for my mom to do that. It always felt to me like slavery. Even though she was free to leave any time. I guess the reality is it, it was no different than what we in the G8 countries refer to as golden handcuffs. You need the job to survive and don't or aren't willing to leave. I think in many ways it was very similar to that. I can only assume. I hope you can listen to this episode without judgment of the words I choose because this is how I felt. It's my personal experience. In Guyana there are three major cultures, two black and from two different continents and one semi-indigenous resulting culture. Black Africans brought into the country as purchased slaves and black East Indians who came to the country as indentured workers on paid contracts. I went to a private Anglican convent school, supposedly the best high school in the country, as the only white girl in the school. I know there were others, but not in those three years. I rode an ugly aubergine bicycle with no handbrakes and a big and bigger than any bike in the racks. And if you want to hear the story behind why that bike, the purchase of that bike was a defining moment and actually the turning point in my self-worth development and in my money story, it's in one of the earlier episodes. I'll put the link in to the show notes. So when people of other cultures talk about how they were the only one of that color or shade or culture in their school, I know exactly how I felt being the minority, not understanding the language or the behaviors of the cultures or the money stories that they had. In Guyana, because of the gold, fillings in their teeth 
were gold. I know you've seen that in pictures from people from Portugal and Brazil and stuff like that, but I, and it was the same thing. If you saw someone with gold in their teeth, that meant that they had some wealth. To us in North America, when we look at someone who has fillings in their teeth, we think they don't have great dental hygiene. Simple things like that. Not only was I not a local at school, I wasn't Anglican or even remotely religious. And the nuns who were white were mean and they were devout. But my education was stellar. We have history in Canada, just like you guys in the U.S., like, you know, people in Australia, like any of the major countries. Some is beyond sad and hurtful. That's why we have this statutory holiday now, uh, Truth and Reconciliation Day. But I don't believe that it would be possible to understand the impact on your thinking about having wealth and living a rich life that prior generations that were slaves and indentured workers in a British colony would imprint on you. One of my close friends, were, her name was Paddle, 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 just like a flower, Paddle. And she had polio and she had, she had braces on both legs. And that's, she went to the best high school and yet that was the medical care. I know there were kids in my circle that thought that we were rich because we came from another country, but I honestly have never felt anything near that, nor had anything material in my world that would say that at that time. That was the way I saw things. Now you may have call, heard me call my style of travel allocentric or peripatetic, the wanderer, no itinerary. My parents are, there were consummate travelers and adventurers. On a three, three month overland trip from London, England to Cape Town, South Africa. Yes, it's possible to do that through the Middle East. A Middle Eastern man offered my dad something he'd never considered. Well, maybe he had knowing my da dad's funny sense of humor. The offer was a camel for my mom. You heard that right. He was offered a camel for my mom. And even trade. My dad got the camel. The man got my mom. Offended? Puzzled? I bet you thought he was offering a ride on a camel for my mom. No, he was offering a trade. What is valuable as currency in one culture can be an insult in another. And no, my dad will say he considered it, but no, he didn't sell my mom. And if you listen to any stand-up comedian, you know that how Asian, Indian, and Jewish families stereotypically view money and its acquisition and growth is very different, not just between them, but to Europeans and North Americans. As global nations, Canada, the United States, the UK, Australia, just to name a few, are melting pots of diverse beliefs and behaviors in relation to money and to success. It's not even possible to state one belief that is consistent across any of them. You can only get ahead with hard work or not. The only professions that make a lot of money are doctors or lawyers or not. If you're an artist or a creative, you can't make a decent living or you can be rich. I come from a descendant line of teachers and educators, unionized, pinned into a salary grid. It's what I saw growing up. And even though I knew I was an entrepreneur, it took many years to shake the income ceiling. I could never embrace the not having eight weeks off to explore the world every year in the summer. What is in your descendant line? Where might some of that thinking be holding you back in relation to your money or your wealth? Is the place that you live, let's call it economically abundant, or is it, as I call it, a backwater? 
did you just get triggered again? Money does that. Money talks about money. Uh, triggers come from all over the place. And these are your opportunities to journal. There is no difference. It's simply how you view it, how you craft your rich life to make you feel abundant. And it's not carved in stone. You can change that at any point in time. If you want to live somewhere else, just pick up and move, make a plan, pick up and move, try it. If it doesn't work, try something else. And for some people, like Jeff Walker of Product Launch Formula, who's mega, mil mega millionaire, it's Durango, Colorado, five hours away from the nearest big city. For others, it's New York City, like Million Dollar Listing New York's Ryan Serhant. For some of you, it might be a combination of things. That's me. I love high energy shot environments paired with longer, quiet, remote, native places. Maybe like the guy that was offering the camel, bartering is your thing. And yet when you do it around your friends or family, there is a collective group cringe and a wave of embarrassment by them. Possibly in a culture, it's expected to haggle for the price or there is a style to the haggle. Something I discovered through the numerous things I've sold online is that, and guys, this is real life data I've collected, not some assumption, that buyers of an Asian culture will come with the exact amount advertised and never ask, will you take this lower amount when they arrive? Whereas other cultures almost always try and cheap out. See there, that's my tell. I have a belief that haggling is being cheap and that's a holdover from my upbringing. And I also never do it. Well, the truth is I almost never buy anything used or discounted because it took me decades to discover that I believed I was only worth things that were used and hand-me-downs. Well, you've heard the story. Everything, including my relationships. In today's world, that is an incredible melange of cultures and individual personalities. Sometimes it's a challenge to differentiate cultural and experiential beliefs from the true scarcity mindset. It's only through an exploration of yourself and exposure to as many different scenarios that you'll see a broader, diverse perspective. I started the episode with a disclaimer that I have blind spots. We all have them. And I wanted to end a bit differently with a request to everyone. We are the only ones who can change the direction of today's world to a, a less harmful one, a more compassionate, abundant one through empathy and through curiosity and never with judgment. In a world where people are afraid to have an open conversation it's on all of us to do that. Curiosity is one of my values, and I personally would like to encourage you to try it out. My go-to phrase for 2023 is, would it be okay with you if I asked about, insert the thing, respectfully, whether they answer yes or answer no, you'll have learned something to take forward into your own life experience. So this podcast got you thinking you'd like to go a bit deeper on this with me. You want to figure your money thing out? I have got so much more to share with you and to give you. And you're really ready to toss the shroud of money worries into the trash forever to stand taller and more confidently in every decision and manifest the most profitable and successful year of your life which means worry-free abundance in life and in business and so much more. Make sure you to sign up for my free four-week course where we're taking a deeper dive into how to transform that money situation in your bank accounts that's keeping you up at night. Easy peasy, lemon squeezy. All you have to do is just pop over to the link bit.ly B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash boost dash money dash eq and invite a friend to go through with you even family 
or maybe coworkers or employees. It's a great way to get a money conversation going. And the more people in your community who are shaking up the scarcity mindset, the more our families and our communities will thrive. Don't be shy or embarrassed. Pass the link on with to as many people as you can because stats show that we never know what's happening in people's lives, especially when it comes to money. I cannot wait to see you inside. And yep, regardless if you sign up for TBN or not, this course is absolutely free. No strings attached. So much value handpicked for you inside it. You're for sure going to experience a transformation in a very short time. Come on, join us and have some fun. bit.ly B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash boost dash money dash eq super excited and i will see you there